happening. We're looking at um, an aspect of health. Last week we looked at rest and the importance of rest. And um, Cheryl will make another presentation next week. I'm not too sure if she will continue with rest. I think she will, or what she will do. Following that, we'll have an. Well, Victory, you, you're muted. I'm not sure if you realize um, we can't hear you. You are mute. You are muted. Sorry. Oh, you didn't hear anything I said. We 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 just heard you start to say following that, and then it went on mute. Oh, I was saying this is the last in the presentation by Pastor Rudy, and um. Next week with Cheryl, we'll continue with I am with the service. And the presentation by Cheryl will continue with talking about rest, the importance of rest as an aspect of health. And then the following month, a new elder will be taken over on Friday evening vespers. Okay? So let us bow our heads as we begin with a word of prayer, after which we're going to a short song service. We'll have a meditational reading that we'll have for the pastor. Let us bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we come at this point in time to tell you thanks for an, another six days of toil and labor, for bringing us safely through another week that we can arrive at this destination in one piece, peace of mind, knowing that you have provided all our needs to make it possible for us to face the challenges of the past week. We ask forgiveness for our sins, which we have committed, in words, thought, deeds, and action, and any way unlike you. We ask that you will cleanse us now, that your Holy Spirit will restore us, and as we go into this presentation tonight, that our minds will be blessed. Bless your people all around the globe who are worshipping you on this your holy day of rest. Especially those who are doing it under difficult and more trying circumstances than we are. May your spirit be there to bless them. And may this Sabbath be a way and means of drawing them closer to you. As we worship you tonight, may you also accept us. And accept our humble, feeble worship. Or we give it the thanks in Jesus' name. Okay, so we will sing as our opening song, a song of praise, song number 83. We're going to get some accompaniment on the piano by Nicholas tonight. So you can sing along in your, mute your mic, but sing along if you know the song. We will try to make a joyful noise here on this end. Worship the King, all glorious above. Gratefully sing His wonderful love. O shield and the defender, the, the ancient of days, a million in splendor and girded with. O tell of His might. Sing of his praise, whose robe is the light, whose canopy sways, his chariots of rather days and the clouds come, and the dark is his path on the wings of the Thy bounty full of care, what tongue can the recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain. And sweetly distills in the dew of the day. 
children of the son of evil and cruel, in the deed we trust, nor find it fulfilled. Thy mercy is how tender, how firm to the end. O make our defender, redeemer, and friend. Let's sing a Sabbath song. Four, three, four. Four, three, four. Okay. Um, we speak on the realm of the bell, and this is a lovely Sabbath song to meditate on. Speak the lambs of the blessed God, country so bright and so fair, and of her its glory shall fail. But what must it be to be fair? We speak of this pathway of God, it will death with you will so rare. It wonders and pleasures untold, but what must it be to be fair? We speak of its spirit of prophecy, from sorrow, temptation, and care, from trials without and with faith, but what must it be? We speak of this service of God, of the road which the glory find where, of the church of the firstborn above, but what must it be to be fair? The morning is all at an end, when raised by the life-saving word, we see the New city descend, adorn as a bright born of God. The city so holy and fair, no sorrow can breathe in the air. No gloom of affliction of sin, no shadow of evil is there. No doubt with temptation and woe. For heaven my spirit prepared, and shortly I also shall know, and feel what it is to be dead. For the bright city shall roll, in glory celestial and fair, with saints and with angels at home, and Jesus himself in One more. This time we'll do a Shabbat song. What what number in the class? Three eighty two. <clears throat> oh, day of rest and gladness. O day of joy and light, O balm of care and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, unto the high and lowly, who bend before the throne, holy, 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 the eternal one. Thou art a God protected from storm that rocks the land. Thou art a Jesus sent with streams of paradise. Thou art a God from kingdom like 
I just want to read one thing or uh, devotional and then we'll hand over to the pastor. And uh, it's called Church Organization. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. The rapid growth of the Sabbath keeping Adventist movement brought the need for an organizational structure that could integrate the scattered local Adventist community. But several panels still echo the words of George Stores, an influential Millerite preacher, who in February 1844 had stated, no church can be organized by man's invention, but what it becomes Babylon the moment it is organized. In response to this concept, Ellen White pointed out that some feared that they would become Babylon if they organized. But it was rather the lack of organization that has transformed many churches into a perfect Babylon confusion. The formation of an organizational structure took place in three, at three basic levels. The first was the organization of local churches. While groups of Sabbath keeping Adventists had begun to form in the mid 1840s, it was only in the 1850s that those groups started to elect deacons, local church elders, and treasurers. The second level was the formation of state conferences. In 1861, the first Seventh day Adventist conference was established in Michigan. And in 1862, six more new conferences were organized. The third level of the early organizational development was the formation of a general conference, which took place in Battle Creek, Michigan, on the 21st of May, 1862. The organization of union conferences and union missions as well as the vision did not take place until the early 20th century. Some may ask, do we still need an organizational church structure? Ellen White declares, let none entertain the thought that we can dispose with organization. It has cost us much study and many prayers for wisdom that we know God has answered to erect the structure. It has been built upon, sorry, it has been built up by his direction through much sacrifice and conflict. Let none of our brethren be so deceived as to attempt to tear it down. For you will bring, for you will thus bring a condition of things that you will not dream of. In the name of the Lord, I declare to you that it is to stand, strengthen, establish, and settled. Okay, so it's food for thought as we go now hand over to Pastor. Thank you, Elder. Good evening, everybody. Just checking if you can hear me. Can anybody hear me, please? Loud and clear, Pastor. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Sister. Okay, so we came to the end of our communication seminar. If you have missed any of the presentations, 
you can go to our YouTube channel and uh, listen to those presentations. Today, I'm going to talk about self-talk. Lee, 91, and uh, Kim, 95, from Korea, set a global record when they celebrated their 82nd wedding anniversary. On their <clears throat> anniversary, they were given special gifts, including hearing aids. I guess, you know, they wanted, uh, you know, not to miss any words that is going to be spoken. Can you imagine the number of conversations this couple has had? I wonder if they ever paid conscious attention to a conversation they may not have even know they had. Few couples do. Every day there is a quest, oh, pardon, a quiet conversation that uh, almost always goes unnoticed. Yet the content of this conversation is the most important discussion a couple ever has. Its words long, linger longer and feel deeper. This conversation, more than any other, determines the closeness or distance we feel. I'm talking about conversation you have with yourself when your spouse is not listening. I'm talking about relational self-talks. Imagine that at the end of each week, your computer categorize, I mean, firstly records, and then categorize everything you said to yourself about your spouse. And imagine that your computer would record and do categorize everything that you said about yourself. Now imagine that you are studying it, what you were saying to yourself about yourself or your spouse. What would you find? First, you would certain, certainly be surprised. You will find, for example, that you were giving some compliments uh, to your spouse, but your spouse never heard it because it was just in your mind. I love it when she wears that dress or he's brilliant with kids and so on and so on. But you may also be shocked to find how much negative comments you quietly grumble about your spouse. He cares more about his car than me. She is so careless with money. You get the idea. You might be astonished to learn how many negative things you're saying to yourself about you. I'm so selfish. I was a real jerk. I should have known better. <clears throat> I'm such an idiot. This kind of self-talk sets up impossible standards and then tears you down for not meeting them. It calls you names, stupid, incompetent, ugly, selfish, weak, and so on. According to some experts, as much as 77% of the average person's self-talk is negative. This is a lot. Imagine the impact this has on any relationship. The brain is the only organ totally essential for your identity. If you have a defective kidney, liver, you know, even heart problem, you can transplant it and you will still be you. But imagine if this would be possible, if you had problem with brain and now you got a new brain. You wouldn't be you. You would acquire a new personality, different memories, different emotions. With a new brain, you would be somebody else. The messages in your brain have a direct impact on your body, spirit, and personality. The secret messages you should repeatedly achieve a higher priority than others. These messages 
that are heard most loudly, most often, and most quickly are the ones that define your self-talk and, of course, your relationships. Each of us, <clears throat> every minute, is holding an unending dialogue with ourselves, a dialogue that colors every experience and relationship. The thoughts are rarely noticed, but they continually shape our attitudes and emotions. Self-talk occurs without any prior reflection or reasoning. Our brain instantly sees it as plausible and valid. Our self-talk need not be accurate. In fact, for many of us, it rarely is. So let's talk about some aspects of self-talks. So self-talk, pardon, self-talk is personal and specific. So this is point number one. Self-talk is personal and specific. Judy has been married for four years. One night at dinner, she asked her husband uh, if he would like to take a walk around the neighborhood after the meal. He said he would rather read the newspapers. This stopped Judy right in her tracks. He doesn't really enjoy my company, she said to herself. Notice that Judy didn't say he's probably very tired after hard work, nor did she say, oh, Probably his knees, knees is bordering him again. She zeroed in on one specific thought that relates to her. Bill doesn't want to be with me. Second, self-talk is quick and spontaneous. For example, you're driving around the town, running some errands, when you spot your husband buying tickets to a football game with his buddies. This is so like him, you say. He doesn't even consider how that might impact my schedule. You stew about it all afternoon. And as your anger builds, you know what you're going to say to him when he comes home. The minute you see him, you snap loudly. You could have asked me first. Obviously surprised, your husband says, ask about what? That's when you let him have it. By revealing, you caught him red-handed. Oh, honey, he says, I wanted to surprise you. Surprise me? I knew you wanted to see my fair lady while it was in town. So I got us tickets for tomorrow's night. Three, self-talk is believed, no matter how irrational. Two professors have just stepped off the platform after they have presented a talk. Husband had noted that his wife had at least a dozen students gathered around her. One student said, what you said tonight really helped me. Other students nodded in agreement. Once they were alone, he asked, so how do you think it went? And she, But she said, I really missed the mark. She has received a heavy dose of praise, but that didn't matter because her own self-talk was telling her that she didn't did a terrible job. Irrational? You bet. That's self-talk. Next point is self-talk is learned. Cindy's father would always open a car door or a particularly car door for her mother. 
In fact, her mom would sit in the passenger seat of the car until her dad walked around her side to open the door for her. That's how a man showed his wife he loves her. Little Cindy would think to herself, who wouldn't? But as you guess, when she got married, her husband never considered this an old-fashioned notion. But a quiet voice inside Cindy's head would say, if he really cherished me, he would open my car door. Of course, she wouldn't say she wouldn't be saying that if she hadn't seen it through her childhood. This aspect of self-talk is the most encouraging. If irrational self-talk can be learned, then it can be unlearned too. So self-talk is personal, specific, quick, spontaneous, believed, and learned. How these silent statements help or hinder our conversation? Okay, now we are going to do our uh, first exercise. The most important step toward using self-talk to your advantage is becoming aware of what you are actually saying to yourself. Once you become aware of your internal dialogue, you can do something about it. This exercise is designed to help you do just that. It will present you with a series of scenarios and ask you to choose one response. Your responses will reveal what you say to yourself when no one is listening. Your inner conversations have a powerful impact on your emotional well-being and your relationship. Becoming aware of exactly what you are saying to yourself about yourself can help you understand why you react the way that you do to events and people in your life. It can help you figure out who you are, control your moods, and deal with your shortcomings. Okay, let's do now the exercise. So if we could have a first slide, please. So, you are hosting a dinner party, and everything goes well until the dessert. When you realize you forgot to pick up the uh, pastry shells for the ice cream. At the end of the evening, you are almost likely to say to yourself, three options. So which one would be, you know, your likely option? Who cares? The evening was great success. B. Sure, the dinner party went all right, but dessert was a failure. C. I ruined everything when I didn't remember to go to the bakery. Okay, so choose A, B, or C. Second, you have a project that requires your team support and you are very eager, excited to start. At the meeting, however, one of your colleagues raises numerous questions about your idea and suggests you hold off until the team has more time to think about it. So, what is going to be your more likely response? A, he might have a good point. B, he doesn't trust me. C, he is either for me or against me. So, what would be your most likely response? Next, scenario. The words that describe your internal dialogue about yourself are A. Positive and ad, uh, upbeat. B. Neutral and on the fence. Or C. Negative and critical. Which one is it? Next one. 
you have just made a major mistake at work that could potentially cost the company a major sale. What are you most likely to say to yourself? A. I may have made a mistake, but I'm still a worthy person. B. I never measure up to the person I want to be. Or C. I'm worthless. Next scenario. You enjoy a much needed outing with friends. When you arrive home, you find your spouse on the couch watching the TV, leftover of food are on the table, dirty plates. And what are you going to say to yourself? A. My spouse must be exhausted. I will uh, wash the dishes and uh, into, I will wash the dishes into shape and then relax on the couch too. B. I never get to go out by myself. Wouldn't my spouse at least be uh, courageous enough to clean up this one time? Cautious, pardon. pardon. Uh, C. I never should have gone out. Things completely fall apart when I'm gone. Or next one. When you were a kid, what kind of messages did you most often receive from your parents? A. Encouraging and loving messages. B. An equal amount of encouraging and critical messages. Or C. Critical and hurtful messages. Seventh scenario, there, there are 10 of them. Uh, you are headed out for the evening and want to wear one of your favorite shirts. It is just uh, finishing the final cycle in your washing machine. You put it in the dryer and the dryer breaks down. Your shirt is completely wet. You won't be able to wear it. So what are you going to say to yourself? A. No problem, I'll wear something else. B. It never fails. This always happens to me. Or C. I cannot stand this. My whole evening is ruined. Next one. You need the help to move some heavy furniture and wonder about asking a friend. What thought is most likely to shoot through your brain? A. I'm pretty sure he can help, and if not, he will say so. B. Am I pushing the limits of this friendship too far? C. I don't deserve to have anyone help me, so I will better not even ask. Nine. Your tennis opponent says out loud to himself, about himself. What a lousy shot. What are you most likely to do? A. Say you're being too hard on yourself. B. Remain silent. C. Say you're right. I've seen better. And the last one. In general, the conversation you have with yourself most day tends to be which one? A. Help you experience more fully and consistently your profound significance. B. Go back and forth between helping and hindering your experience of profound significance. Or C. Keep you from experiencing your profound significance. Okay, so this was our exercise. So if, you're, if you answer mainly A, it is safe to say that your self-talk is based on a solid sense of significance. You tend to consistently see things in their uh, proper perspective and rarely punish yourself for mistakes. 
your self-talk is based on a, a reality of the situation. If your uh, shirt was wet, for example, you would simply choose another one. No big deal. Also, your negative situations don't tend to elicit a negative emotional response. This is a sure sign of a good self-talk. Plus, if you have made a mistake, you don't see yourself as a mistake. Of course, if nearly every one of your answers was A, you may want to review how honest you were with yourself. If you answer mainly B, your self-talk tends to be more negative than beneficial. While you are not likely to punish yourself for very long, you have much to learn to improve your self-talk. If you <clears throat> answer mainly C, your self-talk shows signs of needing serious attention and repair. In all likelihood, you are suffering from a low sense of self-worth. You have a very difficult time separating who you are from what you do. What can you do? Plenty. Next part will help you improve your self-talk. But you also may want to consider a few sessions with a life coach or a counselor. Are the results of a self-test like this uh, generalizations? Of course. However, this simple self-test can at least help you identify your general tendencies. Review a conversation you had with your spouse or anybody else today. Just think about your conversation that you had with anybody today. Now, review the messages you sent to yourself during those conversations. You know, those messages, self thoughts that, that you didn't verbalize. Are those conversations coming to your uh, mind as readily? Not if you are like most people. We remember, we recall, uh, you know, those conversations that we vocalized. But, you know, those that we didn't, we don't remember that much. But those self talks, Internal conversations are real. You may not always be aware of them, but that doesn't stop it from shaping your relationship. And that doesn't have to stop you from doing something about it. The key, of course, is awareness. Once you become aware of your self-talk, you can do something about it. It has to do with how much you respect yourself and how much you respect your spouse. Which brings us back to uncovering your personal fear factor. We were talking about that, you know, fear of losing either time or approval or loyalty or quality. When you invite uh, respect to take part in your understanding of your own fear factor as well as your spouses, your self-talk takes a quantum leap in quality because respect ensures emotional safety. Okay, now we are going to do a second test. Testing respect levels. This exercise is designed to raise your level of awareness. So you need to uh, rate the following 12 statements with numbers 1 to 10. Number 1 is rarely, and number 10 is always. And of course, there are numbers between 1 and 10. Okay, let's go to ex through exercise. Number 1, I honor my spouse's decisions. Is it 1, like rarely? 10 always or somewhere in between. 
I honor my spouse's decision. <clears throat> Two, I feel proud to be with my spouse. Three, I believe our relationship is great because of my spouse. Four, I sincerely appreciate what my spouse brings to our relationship. Five, I feel very secure in my spouse's commitment to me. Six, I rarely prize how special my spouse is. Seven, I believe I'm doing the very best I can as a spouse. Eight, I know I'm deeply loved by, by, by my spouse. Nine, I make sure my own needs as well as my spouse's get met. Ten, I have confidence in my ability to make good decisions. Eleven, I know I'm still worthwhile even when I disappoint my spouse. And the last one, I'm not afraid to speak my mind and I don't sweep my feelings under the rug. Okay, so if we can have the next slide, uh, you need to now add up scores for items one to six. So items one to six is your spouse respect score. And then add up items, uh, scores for items uh, seven to 12, which are your self respect score. Okay, so this is the end of our exercise. <clears throat> If you were to sum up all your self-talk statement as they speak to your relationship and put the negative ones on one side uh, and the positive one on the other side of the scale, which one would win? The more positive your relationship messages are, the more likely you are to respect your spouse's safety need and thus enjoy your relationship. But one negative self-statement that is expressed can undo dozens of positive ones that are not expressed. It's Thursday night and you want your husband to suggest a restaurant for dinner. After all, a loving husband would want to make it easy on his wife and spend some time together. But that thought never crosses his mind. And you don't say a word because he should initiate it. So you go through the leftovers in the fridge and sit down to eat. Maybe we will still have a nice conversation, you say to yourself. But you feel disappointed. As your spouse points to the salad across the table, while eating leftover spaghetti. You want to connect, but he's too busy eating, like he's late for a flight. Actually, it's a game on TV. So you remain silent because a woman shouldn't have to ask her spouse to talk to her. On top of that, you think if he really cared about me, he would want to find out how I am doing. So your fear factor of losing his loyalty kicks in and you throw a pity party on your side of the kitchen table. He doesn't even know it. 
So you just sit there, feel rejected, depressed, sulking. Then you quietly mutter to yourself, so much for devotion. All the while, your self-respect is taking a nosedive. Let's take a good look at your self-talk in this situation. If you were to monitor it, you would soon realize that you were uh, being your own worst enemy. Your goal was to connect with your spouse and see some evidence of devotion on his part, but you ended up trying to punish him for not initiating a conversation. In the end, you only punish yourself. But how would your mood have changed if you said to yourself, I cannot expect him to read my mind. He doesn't know I would like to go out tonight and enjoy a conversation. Or just because he doesn't initiate a conversation in this moment, it doesn't mean he is not interested in me and devoted to our relationship. Sure, it may take some mental muscle to raise these thoughts, but aren't they more accurate, more rational? This kind of self-talk increases your self-respect and your spouse's respect. With a more rational internal dialogue, you feel empowered to say, I really want to go out to eat tonight and just spend some time together. You make your desires known. There is no mind reading and you respect your spouse in the process. Relational self-talk hangs on two hinges, self-respect and spouse respect. And the more you cultivate both of them, the more you will honor each other's personal fear factors and enjoy the relationship. Every business executive knows success begins when you capitalize on what you do best. The same can be said of a relationship. We can become so consumed with our deficits that we neglect our strengths completely. That's the danger of negative self-talk about either you or your spouse. So, make a list of few things you appreciate about your spouse. It's essential that you are as specific as possible and focus on character traits, not just what he or she does for you. For each character trait, it would be helpful to note two or three examples of how you typically notice it, this trait in your spouse. Consider your spouse's strength in the following categories. Mental, social, physical, spiritual. Every spouse wants to feel mentally capable. <coughs> socially desirable, physically attractive, and spiritually vital. So consider comments that would boost your spouse's self-respect in each area. The real value of this exercise is found in keeping your list handy. The one you made for your spouse and the one your spouse made for you. When you have time, Sit together and share the list with each other. Okay, so this was the last presentation. Now I'm going to summarize the whole seminar. The quiet conversation taking place in your head determines the closeness or distance you feel with each other. When you remember your spouse's personal fear factor 
and respect his or her emotional safety need. You are a good communicator. When you intentionally respect and honor your spouse's talk style, you're a good communicator. When you put yourself in your spouse's shoes with plenty of empathy, you're a good communicator. When you keep your gender differences in mind and carefully listen, you're a good communicator. When you do all of this, you have achieved a high communication IQ. Thank you. All right, we'd like to thank you, Asta, for those wonderful presentation. Um, for me tonight is, yeah, the two things that my two takeaway for tonight is respect, self-respect, respect yourself and respect your partner. So that was really interesting, it was thought-provoking, and I believe we all benefited from your presentation. All right, so we're going to bring our service to a close. We're going to sing our closing song. And then we're going to have a prayer. And as I said, just to remind everybody, um, Sunday night, we carry on again with our Sunday evening worship. And um, I have been doing some lectures on the origin of Christianity, where it all began and how it all began. So we'll continue that on Sunday. Next week, Wednesday as well, we'll have a prayer meeting, midweek prayer meeting. Pastor carries with that, take that over. So just remember to be on time. It's usually difficult for me getting back on time on Wednesday night. I'll try. And then next Friday, we carry over to our Vespa service. And as I said, the Victory family will be taking up the Vespa service again next week. And Cheryl will continue with her presentation. All right, so we're going to bring our service, our time well spent. To an end, we're going to have a closing song. So what number, Nicholas? 340. Song number 340. And then let me see, I'll ask, um, I'll mm -hmm. ask Brother Joey to give us the closing prayer. 340. So as I say, mute your mic, but you can sing along. One space. We have heard a joyful song. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. Bring the news to every land. Spread the peace and cross the way. Come, Lord, take our Lord's commandment. Jesus save, Jesus save. Opted on the rolling tide. Jesus save, Jesus save. Dealt with sin as far and wide. Jesus save, Jesus save. Bring the islands of the sea. Echo back the ocean sea. Earth shall keep a jubilee. Jesus save, Jesus save. Sing among the battle cry. Jesus save, Jesus save. By his death and endless life. Jesus save, Jesus save. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph for the truth. Jesus save, Jesus save. With the winds a mighty voice, Jesus save, Jesus save. Let the nations now rejoice, Jesus save, Jesus save. Now salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory. 
Brother Joey, would you give us a closing prayer, please? Sure. Almighty and everlasting fathers, we come before you this evening, great God. Thank you for bringing us to this point where we can gather as brothers and sisters, as followers of you, dear Jesus. Please bless us as we go into our Sabbath and help that the information that Pastor has given to us, not this does not mark the end, dear God, but this marks the beginning of us trying to live together with our spouse and our brothers and our sisters, our children and those around us. Help us to make a marked difference and help us to show some sort of improvement through your love, dear God. It's only by your love we can go forward and we can win any victory, great God. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Please bless us and keep us as we rest this evening and come prepared tomorrow to give you thanks and praise, to worship you and to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Thanks for these and other mercies I pray and ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay. Amen. And Sabbath evening and hopefully we shall meet tomorrow where we will fellowship and where we will continue to serve our God. Have a good night. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. To glory. Have a blessed Sabbath, everyone. See you tomorrow. God bless you. Good night.